Hi everyone, in this video we are going to discuss chlorofluorocarbons, also known as CFC. So chlorofluorocarbons is quite the mouthful, so most of the time when people refer to these molecules, they are calling them CFCs. So let's break it apart because it is quite complex. Chloro comes from the element chlorine, fluoro comes from fluorine, and then carbon, that's a tricky one, but I bet you got it, that from, comes from carbon. So before we move on, I want to ask you a quick review question. What group are both chlorine and fluorine in? I don't want a number, I want a name of the group. Go. All right, if you said halogens, you are definitely correct. Chlorine and fluorine are definitely in group seven, also known as the halogens. Now, back to CFCs. There are two CFCs that I absolutely expect you to know. They are called Freon 11 and Freon 12. So Freon 11 has a carbon in the middle. It has one fluorine. Okay, and I'm gonna draw in my lone pairs just so you know and kind of get used to them, but make sure you're doing this when you're drawing out your Lewis structures. It has three chlorine, so one carbon, one fluorine, oops, and three chlorines. Now, this one that I just drew out, this one is called Freon 11. So Freon, F-R-E-O-N 11. Now we also want you to know Freon 12. So Freon 12 has one carbon, but it has two fluorines and two chlorines. Now, does it matter how you draw this out? Can the fluorines be next to each other? Can they be across from each other? Yes, it 100% matters. You must draw the fluorines next to each other and the chlorines next to each other. If you draw the chlorines opposite of each other in the trans position, you change the polarity, you change the reactivity. So you absolutely need to understand that Freon 12 looks like this. The fluorines are next to each other, chlorines are next to each other. Now, let's talk about CFCs. One of the most important things you need to understand, CFCs are not natural. They're not natural. So what does that mean? What do I mean when I say that? You are never going to find a CFC out in the atmosphere that just existed, that, it, that like a plant created it or it's there. You are only going to find CFCs that someone has synthesized in lab. A chemist has been there, they've mixed some stuff together, and they created a CFC. But CFCs do not exist naturally on this planet. So why did we invent them? Well, in the 1930s, we had serious issues with our refrigerators. We were using toxic gases, ammonia and SO2. So think about this. In your fridge where you put your food, we are using toxic gases to keep the fridge cool. It was a big problem. So what happened is we invented these CFCs right here, okay, these CFCs as a, an alternative for these toxic gases. So why did we use CFCs? Well, here's some important things. First of all, they're non-toxic, so that's great. We definitely want non-toxic things in our fridge. They're odorless, even better. They're colorless, which is great. And I think this one's even more important. They're inflammable. So you no longer have this refrigerator that's toxic that could potentially catch on fire. So in other words, these are stable molecules. Some of them, not all of them, could actually last for 20, 120 years in our atmosphere. That is a long time. So you have to think about that. In the refrigerator business, these people are super ecstatic that they invented a gas that is so stable that they could put in the fridge and the fridge will last. So they make quality products. Now, in the 1960s, the CFCs really took off because we learned that we could put CFCs in air conditioning or in air conditioner units. So think about this. People down in Miami all of a sudden can have an air conditioner and they're happy. And so it's, what's really neat, actually, and people don't realize this, is CFCs, which really is actually air conditioning, helped so that people would actually move down to the south. And so it's kind of neat. CFCs are yay, except for the fact that they're not. They're actually really, really bad. But we're going to go into that in just a second. But before I do that, I want to ask you a quick question. We also have these things called halons. Now, halons are like a cousin, maybe, distant cousin, close cousin of a CFC. And so the big difference is that they have bromine in them instead of chlorine. And so CFCs have chlorine, halons have bromine. So let's talk, talk about one specifically. I want to talk about halon 1301, and that has that formula right there. Please draw me the Lewis structure. Go. All right, did we get an answer? Hopefully we did. Let's draw out the structure so that we can just make sure we're all on the same page. So the first thing you do, if you ever see a carbon, try to put it in the center. Carbon wants to be in the middle. Now we have four other things, so let's just draw it around there. Here's your bromine, and then we have three fluorines. And so I kind of showed you what the structure looked like above when we were talking about our Freon 11. But there you go, there's your halon 1301. So hopefully you were able to answer some questions about that and draw out the structure properly. If you're still struck, stuck on those structures, please go back and review, you absolutely need to know how to do that. All right, moving forward. So now, we move to the 1970s. So in the 1970s, there were these two really awesome people, Roland and Molina. 
Now, what they did is they were like, what do you think happens when we take Freon 12, okay? So that has two fluorines on it and two chlorines on it. This was Freon 12. What happens when we shine light on it? And you're gonna see chemists do that. They're always like, what happens if we shine light on it? What happens if we set that on fire? What happens if we blow that up? And so luckily they just wanted to see what happened when they put light on it. So they put some UV light on it, very high energy. So wavelengths of less than 220 nanometers. And what they saw is that this molecule, so your Freon 12, actually broke apart into this guy right here. So the carbon still had the two fluorines on there and one chlorine, but it formed these things. What are those called again? All right, hopefully you got that answer correct. It is definitely called a radical. So anytime when we see one unpaired electron on something, we just represent it with a big dot and that is called a, react a radical. When I say radical, I want you thinking reactive. It is so, so reactive. So here is what happens when chlorine radical goes into our environment. Number one, it destroys our ozone. And I'm not using the word destroy because I like to have high energy and get you excited about chemistry. I'm using the word destroy because it actually destroys our ozone. So it takes our ozone molecules, so three of them, and converts them to three oxygen molecules. Now, how does this happen? Well, it turns out that chlorine radical is actually a catalyst. Now, we've mentioned catalysts before, but just in case you've forgotten, they are something that are consumed, so they're used as a reactant right in the very beginning. And, this is the most important part, they are regenerated. Now, that means they are used up in the very beginning. So here they are as a reactant, they react with the ozone, a lot of stuff happens. So this big mechanism, blah, 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 blah. At the very end, it spits out oxygen, but it also creates another chlorine radical. So that chlorine radical runs right back to the top and breaks apart more ozone um, molecules over and over and over again, just one. And it turns out that one chlorine radical, just one, can destroy, I'm using the word destroy again, 100,000 ozone molecules. Seriously, think about that. One chlorine molecule can destroy a hundred, I should say atom, one chlorine radical can destroy a hundred thousand ozone molecules. CFCs are so, 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 so bad for us up in the stratosphere. It's so bad for us. In fact, let me show you this graph, which is called the smoking gun. People started measuring out, like I told you, the ozone concentrations, but they also started measuring out our stratospheric chlorine concentration. So they're measuring this right here, our concentration. And what they saw is that our maps were literally just exactly the same. So we start here pretty flat for our concentration of ozone. All of a sudden we start having an increase of our chlorine. Well, the second we have an increase of our chlorine, we see a huge decrease in our ozone concentration. Then we see a dip off. The chlorine goes a little bit lower, ozone gets a little bit higher. Then we see the chlorine concentration shoot straight up and oh, same thing. The ozone one gets lower and lower and lower. This graph is called the smoking gun. Let me get rid of it so you can see a pretty thing. This is called the smoking gun graph. Thank goodness this was published because the world responded in such a beautiful way and they actually were able to move forward and we were able to protect our ozone layer. But it was this graph, this one right here, showing how the second you increase your chlorine concentration, we have a huge decrease in our ozone concentration. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's make sure we can answer one question together here. As the concentration of chlorine increases, the concentration of ozone, what? What happens? Take care of yourself, guys. Drink water.